So metabolic phenotyping in health and disease, what does that actually mean? Um, probably it's best first to talk about what a phenotype is. So I'd like to start with a genotype. Everyone probably these days in the area of the genome should know what a genotype is. It's the collection of genes that you have in your body. And the great thing about genotype is that it's actually a set of possibilities and potentials. Right? So uh, I joke when I say this, I should be six feet tall with an IQ of 150. But because of my gene interactions with the environment, um, I'm actually five foot eight and have an IQ that's much lower than that. So my genes say that I should be tall and intelligent. What actually happened, the phenotype that I've acquired, is less tall and less intelligent than the potential. So one of the things we know about the genes that you have in your bodies is that you were born with them, you got them from your parents, and you will die with them, largely unchanged. But when you were born, you were small and helpless, and with time, you know, the, the baby phenotype changed into a young person phenotype, changed into an adult phenotype, will change into an old person phenotype, but it's all with the same genes. Now, one of the things that we know is that the environment can affect this a lot. So if you are badly nutritioned, poorly fed as a child, as an adult, you will not achieve the full potential that your body might have. If you smoke a lot of cigarettes and drink a lot of alcohol, you will probably die younger than your genes would allow you to die if you lived on a healthy lifestyle. So, how can we think in this? Um, the phenotype that you have is your body and its shape. Your body is built of cells, that's proteins, lipids and metabolites. Now, I'm interested in metabolites. If you look at the paradigm that Watson and Crick came up with, genes produce proteins, proteins do stuff which makes metabolites. And metabolism um, is what keeps you alive. I mean, if you eat a load of food or ingest a chocolate bar, you know, the glucose in that food is metabolized to energy. If you eat too much, um, those components in the food are metabolized into fat and you get heavier. These things affect the, the expression of metabolites in your body. So if, if you accept that the genome is potential, the proteome, which is the product of the production of proteins from the genes, is, is partially a response to the environment, but the emergent property that you see most easily is metabolism. By looking at metabolites, these are the small, low molecular weight molecules like amino acids, sugars, lipids, things like cholesterol, steroid hormones, things like that in your circulation and in your excreta, in urine particularly, um, in breath, for breath volatiles, you can get a very good idea of what's going on in the body. I mean, as an example, I mean, one of the diagnostic features for diabetes is high glucose, right? Well, glucose is a fairly readily measurable metabolite and we've been measuring it for a very long time indeed. Um, you know, diabetes mellitus is about sticking your finger in urine, tasting it, and oh, it tastes sweet. And the Greeks knew about that very well. So this, this concept of using metabolites to indicate disease is not new. So, in the 21st century, we are equipped with a whole array of amazing analytical instruments. Um, NMR spectrometers, mass spectrometers, we can investigate what's going on in biological fluids in huge detail. We can do that for individuals, so we can do what we call metabotyping, looking at the metabolic profiles of urine, which if you like are a history of what's gone in your body, what's gone on in your body for the last couple of hours. We can take blood and plasma, and that's what's going on in, in your body right now, because your blood is in communication with all the tissues in your body. Right? Um, we can also take tissue biopsies if we need to know what's going on in particular tissue. So in, in surgery, for example, a clinician might want to know whether he's looking at a, cast, at, at a cancer cell or not. Well, some of the metabolites will tell you that as well. This gives us a very, very detailed picture of what's going on. What can we do with this knowledge? 
one of the things we can do, if we know what a healthy metabotype is, if we know what the composition of urine of a healthy person is, the blood of a healthy person is, and we do this in la for large numbers of people so we know it applies to a population, then we can think about looking at what an unhealthy profile is. All right, so if someone's got diabetes or a similar metabolic disease, it's fairly easy to see what the metabolic profile is and compare how it differs to that from a, a healthy person. If we then start taking samples earlier and earlier during a person's life, we may be able to do two things. Firstly, build models that predict whether someone has a propensity for getting a metabolic disease and show when they're beginning to get the metabolic disease. So if I draw a metabolic trajectory in the air, that's a normal healthy life. It starts at birth, ends at 105. Okay? This is the same person, but having a bad diet. And the trajectories diverge. So instead of going up together, they go over. Now, suppose that we could tell that person at this point, before there's any real damage, that he needs to change, he or she needs to change their lifestyle to move them back onto this. Wouldn't that be a valuable thing to do? I think so. If we could look at populations and work out why populations or individuals in that population are more susceptible to disease than others, that's a really good thing, a useful thing to do. Now, in part, we can get this from genomics, measuring a person's genome very early uh, can give a prediction of whether they're likely to get a particular condition. But it's a prediction. Now what looking at the metabolome or the metabolome does is tells you whether that is actually happening or not. All right. Now you can't do anything about your genes. You're stuck with them. Your parents gave them to you. You can go and blame them if you've got bad ones. But you can't change them. You can change your lifestyle. So this sort of knowledge could be immensely empowering. So. The work that we do here at Imperial is designed to obtain these highly detailed metabolic profiles for normal people in epidemiological studies, for ill people, and to find biomarkers of the disease. I mean, one of the things that's encoded probably in these profiles is whether someone will respond to a disease or not. I talked about biological fluids that are easily accessible, like urine. Um, nobody usually objects to giving you a urine sample. Blood, people are a little more uh, cautious about giving you blood samples, and there's uh, saliva as well, which are easily obtained. And uh, my colleague, Professor Jeremy Nicholson, who's pretty much led this field in the UK, um, has developed a huge range of methods for that. What about cancer, though? If a surgeon is working on your body, taking out a cancer. What you would really like to know is that firstly, what he's cutting is cancer and not healthy tissue. And secondly, that he's got all of it removed. And another colleague of mine, Professor Zoltan Takash, has developed with Jeremy something called the eye knife, the intelligent knife. And this is uh, a device that as it's cutting through the cancerous tissue, which these days is done uh, in more clever ways than using a scalpel, it generates a smoke. And the smoke is taken into a mass spectrometer so that in real time the surgeon can see whether he's cutting through cancer tissue or fresh tissue, healthy tissue, which you want to keep. So that's going to revolutionize, absolutely revolutionize the way we do surgery. And it's based essentially on the mass spectrometer being able to smell the tissue. Uh, and if you want to understand how it works, think about the last time you cooked bacon uh, you know, you can tell from your own nose that you're cooking bacon rather than steak. Well, the mass spectrometer is doing pretty much the same thing in real time. You know, I can envisage a time when actually you, don't, you won't need surgeons because the instrument will be smart enough to do the cutting all by itself. Uh, that really has to be something worth doing. The next step of having done all of this broad metabolic phenotyping is to hunt into the forest of peaks or, or metabolites that we find to find the one or two that are actually diagnostic for a particular condition. Because then we can hope to convert these into clinical tests. Because frankly, measuring four or 5,000 metabolites, when only two or three of them are actually changing in response to a condition, 
um, is silly when you can measure those three or four. So part of a large part of the research here is into obtaining these metabotypes, working out what the important molecules are in those metabotypes, and exploiting those in a more intelligent way. So again, uh, Professor Nicholson's developed the concept of the uh, patient journey, where as a patient you would come into the hospital, you would have urine and plasma samples taken and measured, on the basis of a huge database that we'd have about lots of other people who've had that condition, we would hope to be able to make a prediction as to which drug treatments you should get and what your metabolic trajectory through your treatment should be. So ideally it should be that way. If by measuring samples through the time it begins to go that way, we can hope to take corrective action to move it back into the right place. And that's the power of metabolites because they're dynamic, they change with time very quickly, whereas genes, I say you're stuck with them.